Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I would like to introduce uh, Luis McGibney. Uh, Luis uh, will talk about uh, Apache Gora, and his uh, uh, his topic is uh, deploying Apache Gora as a query broker. Uh, the presentation will provide an in-depth account of the problem scenario, the proposed solution including code examples and a running example of how Gora can be deployed to address such uh, data set resource selection and resource merging. Uh, <coughs> That's the, I think that'll probably do. <laughs> okay. Luis has uh, recently finished uh, his postdoc uh, at Stanford University in the field of engineering informatics. He holds a PhD in Legislative Informatics from Glasgow uh, Chalcedonian University. Uh, he's a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, you can find him lingering on several lists, including Gora, Nuts, any 23 uh, Open Office, and uh, several other uh, where he sits as uh, on the PMC. Uh, list, uh, Louis' interests uh, include web search, information retrieval, big data, and NoSQL. Uh, technologies, all within the context of distributing computing. He's an advocate of the Google Summer of Code program, being a mentor since 2012. Uh, outside his academic life, he has uh, presented at numerous uh, ApacheCons, Cassandra Summits, meetups uh, in San Francisco Bay Area, and meetups in the UK and Dublin. Thank you, Apostolos. Welcome, Luis. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Apostolos. So it's quite a nice. Um, size room and uh, I would I would like uh, if there's questions this this presentation when I started writing it um, up so I did some work on this um, last year and um, I've been doing a lot of coding and I wanted to try and try and talk about um, federated search and whether you know Gora was a good solution for for addressing the problem scenario that I encountered. So some of this is kind of high level and I'm going to be talking quite a lot about, you know, just the problem and about some of the, some of the, um, some of the observations that I had as, as I kept on working on this as, as things moved on. So, okay, a bit about myself. Um, some pictures over the last while. Uh, I'm a cycling fanatic, I absolutely love cycling. Um, I'm a musician um, and I've been part of Apache for a number of years. Um, I originally started at Apache Nutch um, because I wanted to try and build search engines for um, the construction industry for specific uh, use cases of, of finding legislation and regulations and things like that. And that's when I discovered Nutch. There were some things that it did do well, very well, and there were some things it didn't do so great. So I started um, working on Nutch. In a, in a previous life, I worked in the construction industry. I was a cost, cost surveyor, quantity surveyor. Um, and yeah, I'm on some, um, you know, I work in quite a couple of projects at Apache. Um, and outside Apache as well. So, this is what um, I'll be going through. So I've got this is work in progress, this query broker. Um, but there's some, I mean, there's a bit of code there which um, I'll be working on and with the aim of, of trying to get the query broker as an example and of, of getting Gora working um, for, for the federated search problem. So, I'm starting out with this thing, Invisible Engines, you know, just trying to create um, the background be behind my motivation for looking at federated search and using Gora. Um, the trek is the text retrieval conference, um, which was uh, the driver behind th this as well. Um, they, they hold tracks on web search, um, federated search. Um, it's all text-based stuff, and uh, it runs every year, and, and I will work towards participating um, within the context of my postdoc. So um, looking then at Gora, looking at Gora as a query broker, um, approach solution architecture, 
and then we can hopefully um, f finish off with, with some discussion and questions. And as I said, please just interrupt me and ask some questions um, as we go through, please. So, this year, um, there's no need for this kind of graph to be three-dimensional. However, if you can imagine this axis here moving up the way is time, and as they go as, and up is um, advances and kind of technological advances. Um, back in back in the day, if you can imagine, this is kind of the main marketplace uh, in in a town or a village or whatever. So people would you know do trade with each other, and, and what was available was taken from local. Um, there wasn't the ability to, you know, cargo freight, fr freight in from, from around the world and stuff like this. So everything was, you know, localised um, and maybe national trade. Uh, but as, 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 you know, technology advanced, we're able to build, you know, ships and sail the seas and, you know, bring, bring more exotic goods and trade more exotic goods. So the marketplaces, these goods were more available. And uh, the point here is that the marketplace um, was able to connect buyers with sellers. And the, 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 whole, the, on, the only reason that, that um, you know, it worked is because the marketplace provided a platform for people to, to get and for people to need to address their, their needs and, and to get what they wanted. And then, of course, as things move on, we, we can get anything really whenever we want it from wherever. Um, but the platform is still there. It's, it, that's not changed. The platform is, is the exact same as it has been for hundreds and hundreds of years. So these are all the same in the sense that what is behind them is the platforms. Um, the sky boxes are a platform for um, you know, the films that you, that you want to maybe buy to see that you know, the Apple phones are a platform for, for people to develop applications and the applications to then be available for people to sell and people to buy. And the same on eBay, it connects buyers and sellers. It's a platform that enables people to do that. So, and Google, of course. Um, the thing is though, that, that this picture, this slide, is that, um, it's like invisible. These platforms are kind of invisible to us. They're not immediately obvious. And what this slide is about is that sometimes invisible is like a strength. So the cheetah there is extremely well camouflaged and that's the, its strength is that, you know, it's, it's behind the scenes and we don't see it. Um, however, it's there and you've got like two seconds to get out of there or your face is going to get clawed off. Um, and the thing is, with this one, is that invisibility can be a strength, but it can also be, or it can also not be a strength. And this guy is playing a practical <laughs> joke that kind of, you know, backfires on him. So, in this case, whatever it was he was trying to do was totally invisible, but it wasn't a strength. Um, and this brings me to this book that I, I kind of got my hands on a number of years back, which is Invisible Engines. And the point that it makes is that these platforms, um, it's about how software platforms drive innovation and um, transform industries. So the way that, um, the, 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 that we don't see these things immediately, but you know, they're, they're there. So, there's quite a lot on that slide there, but um, there's some points that I want to try and make here. And back in maybe 2008, when you looked at the PC industry, it was extremely easy and, and obvious to equate the fact that you know Windows, you know, had a monopoly, and 70%, according to you know Forrester research, and 30% in 20, 2012. But it's less. Um, trivial to equate, for example, Android with having monopoly over the, the mobile market. Okay, they did in third quarter 2013 
have 80% of uh, handsets that were shipped were shipped with Android. However, they don't have the monopoly over the market because and uh, Android, uh, you, sorry, you can't make that direct connection um, because the Android system is a platform and it's one part in this complex structure of enabling you know, people to come together, people to develop applications, sell applications, et cetera, et cetera. So these platforms um, enable innovation and enable people to uh, you know, transform the industries that, that we work in. The Apache web server is an example of, of doing exactly that. Apache Hadoop is the same. And you, know, you can insert the next game changer there. Um, so, federated web search was something that um, that I b kind of became interested in because um, we we take it for granted that when you go to try and do search, that um, we should be able to you know query. We don't want to know about where this data is, whether it be geographically distributed or you know, on, on the hundreds of different nodes, which might be running different software. And we don't want to really know about that stuff. We just take it for granted that you should be able to do federated search and it should be able to work. And some examples are like price comparison sites and stuff like this, where essentially, um, I mean, I booked my flight with Skyscanner. And you, you go on Skyscanner, you submit your query, and you put in some, um, you know, field values for the date you want to travel over. And you can see when it goes through that it hits some other backend APIs for um, content providers, people that, that, that have flights available, et cetera. And you know you get some results back. Um, and the thing about federated search is that we might want to query a number of data sources. Um, and, and, and federated search, in essence, should enable us to try and do that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, there's a lot here um, on this slide. But essentially, um, what, what I'm trying to convey here, or what, what I'm trying to really communicate, is that um, when we, when, if you take, for example, the Skyscanner uh, site, so it will go and query all these data sources. And this is going to work at best in linear time. And say, for example, it's OK for us to query maybe 10 sources. But what happens when it's you know, 10,000 sources. Um, how long can we afford to wait while Skyscanner goes and gets this information for us? Because there is a penalty for using services like Skyscanner. It's not instantaneous. You don't get the feedback straight away. You do need to wait, and you can see the search, the, the, the search results coming to you. Um, so, and the thing is as well that if we query more data sources, then, uh, the running time um, increases, so it's much less efficient than, than linear time when we take in these other factors, such as maybe network traffic or whatever, whatever it might well be. Um, the thing is as well that uh, we, we, if we had this stuff cached, then uh, with price comparison sites, all you're doing is getting the usually getting the lowest. So although we uh, can get the lowest in um, constant time, we do pay the price depending on it initially having to obtain that data. And the questions that I wanted to ask and get some answers for was that, you know, what's the better way of doing it? Do we need to query every underlying data source every time? Um, because say, for example, I want to travel on the first of the month, but then I realize that it isn't the first of the month, it's the second of the month. I resubmit my query, and again, we need to query all these different data sources. And what happens when we're dealing with domains other than simple integers and price comparison sites? What happens if we want to do this with text? Or what happens if, if I want to search for scientific journals? Or what happens if I want to search for um, recipes? you know, to, to, to bake a cake or, or something like this. I mean, price comparison works on the, the integers, which is somewhat of a, 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 a more trivial um, search uh, example, because when we're ranking the results, 
we're just picking the lowest um, figure and presenting that usually first to the user. So, Federated Web Search Track at um, the Trek, which is uh, it's the National Institute. If, if, if you're interested in this stuff, you can go on their site. And essentially what it is, is they provide um, that data set that you need, it's a licensed data set, you can, but you can get your hands on it for various purposes. 157 different search engines. So it's common sense that we're going to, we're going to pay a very high price if we want to query 157 different um, search engines or the, the indexes that, that you might have. Um, that's, not, that's not really a t a t t too trivial, um, and it's going to, we're going to certainly pay the price for it. So one aspect of, of, of federated search is vertical selection. These are different tracks, and um, what I've done in these next three slides is, is really just try and describe a bit about these tasks that, that, that we want to do. Um, there's various levels of them being evaluated, etc. And the vertical, uh, vertical selection is one of them. The one that, that most kind of interests me is resource selection. So based on all these underlying data sources, we only really want to be querying maybe one or two, or maybe five, or maybe 10, right? But what we want to be querying, we want to ensure that the data sources we are querying are relevant for the query. We don't want to be querying, for example, a LinkedIn data set if we want to know about going on holiday to um, Vancouver or something, we want to be we want to be querying the Expedia data set, you know. Um, there's some if you get the slides, there's some uh, links to various papers and stuff that, that describe about um, various ranking um, operations and, and learning to rank and all this kind of stuff. So you can you can go and look at that. So results merging is. The second aspect of that, that I was kind of interested in here was that um, yes, we can we can do the um, the search. Essentially, though, what we want to be doing is returning the, the results to the the user as a singly ranked list. Um, so, to the rescue, Apache Gora, um, and to be honest with you, uh, I mean Gora. I worked on this because I was working on Gora, and Gora might not be an ideal solution for um, federated, this federated search problem. There might be other ways out there. Um, and part of my curiosity, I suppose, was, was kind of working on this. So in Gora, it stands for Generic Object Representation Using Avro. Um, for, for, uh, for those of you that, that um, weren't here with when Renato's last one. And part of, of Gora is that we want to be able to um, access the data regardless of its location. So we provide a common API for all these backends, um, various NoSQL databases, um, Solar, Lucene, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to be able to access it regardless of a location. So that was why I thought it was maybe a reasonable fit for you know, attempting a federated search. So this is what we support. Um, the Solar, Lucene stuff, Accumulo, Cassandra, Avro, and HBase has all been upgraded as of an issue called Gora 94, which essentially started off as an upgrade of the, Ibro, uh, the Avro library from 1.33, which is quite honestly ancient, to 1.7. Um, but what that entailed was doing a lot of upgrades elsewhere and the Oracle NoSQL database was a project by Apostolos for his Google, Google Summer of Code. The Amazon DynamoDB was uh, a project of Renato's. And um, so that's just, you know, that's the, the various backends that we support. So there's also a data store, which is Memory Store. And Memory Store, um, we predominantly use, just use for tests. However, I wanted to try and see if it was a, if it was an option for essentially creating a, this cache rather than going to all these different data sources that, that of, of, of using it as you know, a cache for, for um, a meta representation of these data stores. And there's some information there about um, 
operations that we can do into the store. And this is a method to execute, which is within, and this is for executing queries. Um, we can create uh, we can create a query object that we pass in to execute that we can define fields that we want to query for. So as well as passing in the key, you can see which fields on the, the object you'd like to query for, and we return a result. Um, the thing is, if we don't pass any, if we don't pass any um, fields, then we query everything. So check if query dot fields is null, and if it's null, then we just query for all fields. And there's some uh, information on, on running time. So that blue isn't too um, isn't too um, vibrant there. Sorry about that. But so I was wanting to focus on resource selection and results merging. Simulate geographically distributed data and heterogeneous storage mediums, which I think is a realistic. Um, representation of these kind of hidden engines, the, the stuff behind the scenes that we don't see. And utilize the strength of Gora, which has been able to get data regardless of its location. So what I decided to do was find terms in the uh, data sources in the 157 different search engines and create a um, term frequency inverse document frequency map, a, a dictionary map of term terms and their occurrence within the data stores. What this doesn't enable me to do is get documents. So for a given query, you don't get the documents. You just get the resource that you want to go to that is going to be most relevant based on the assumption that term relevance is an indication of, um, sorry, term frequency is an indication of resource um, relevance. And I used my out for this. There's some code on the GitHub stuff and uh, it was very easy to use. Um, the only problem that I had at first is actually cleaning up the resulting dictionary map. So this is what the dictionary map looks like. As you can see, the, this is just a snippet from the first part of it. I mean, that's only E. Some of the dictionary maps were, you know, 20, 20 odd thousand lines and occurrence, term and occurrence, frequency. So what, what did this look? So architecture and deployment. So essentially the query broker would take this kind of form where we have all these different data sets in all these different places. They can be at web service based data stores or they can just be Cassandra or H based clusters or Accumulo or any of the other data stores that we have. And we're just we're pulling in information and, and persist, well, storing it in memory into the mem store. This is a uh, JSON that we use in Avro. So um, we compile this, this JSON down to a persistent Java bean that we then push the data through. And th these are fields, go to data store name which the only th thing that we're using here is dictionary map. These other ones are just additional information about the store. So we've got data store name, the native data store name, which would maybe be HBase or, or whatever it might well be, the IP address it's at, um, the version that it's at, that it's on, sorry, the size of the data held within the store, number of records there, and the dictionary map, which as I said, contains the term frequency mappings. And so it looks something like this for resource selection, where we only want maybe 10 data stores. So this is just a constant that we can define. We've got a count there, and we're saying for all the maps in the mem store, for the input strings, what we want to do is see if the map contains the term, get the frequency for it, and if it's greater than some threshold, then reset the, uh, the frequency, and then we can put that, increase the count, and if the count is less than uh, our threshold, then we can skip out. Cons. 
Some cons with Memstore, it's not finished, as I said. Um, part of this was assessing really whether uh, Gora was an adequate tool for, for addressing this. And there's some things which is good that we've flagged up with this. Um, because it's the mem store, we can't share it across multiple uh, JVMs. There's an issue with um, concurrency, uh, that map is static. Um, the key, we cast the key, and um, we can get an exception uh, if there's a legal casting going on. This is an issue on the Gora Jira um, that two people are working on just now, one of them you know, being myself, and uh, we're hoping to think, well, that should be fixed sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, future aims for this, really, is to get it into trunk, to get this as a, an example of, of you know, how you can get Gora working for maybe some of the uh, problems that, that might be like this, and to get a REST API for it. So you could maybe use the query broker for um, any, any, any similar kind of circumstance. And I want to try and maybe discuss some stuff on it. If you guys, um, if anybody's doing federated search, if anybody's doing any kind of similar stuff. Um, I had said in it that I've got an example of this running. I don't, I don't have an example with me here today. Um, but we're working on the code to try and get into the Gora code base. Hopefully, maybe this week, but I'll definitely be working on it. Um, and really, uh, the presentation is more or less it. So I'm saying thank you for the last 40 minutes, but I think I've finished up for a wee bit earlier. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Apache Con. And it would be great to see you maybe on the Gora lists. We're trying to push updates, and it's talks like this that uh, me, myself, Renato, Apostolos, and various others have been trying to, you know, keep the code base moving, keep Gora moving onwards. Um, this is quite a, this isn't a traditional kind of me method for using Gora. Um, as uh, Renato stated, Gora uh, main use case was an Apache Nutch for abstracting um, the storage of web page and host data. So um, that's what the main use case for it we've been using. Um, Query Broker is just an example. We've, there's other examples in the code base of getting up to speed with it. Um, and to be honest with you, that, that's, that's more or less me um, on you know, kind of my, my experiences on using Gora in this context. And um, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll take some questions. Tom? Um, it's actually something we touched upon last night. So the, more, mostly the main, the main way that we see people using Gora is pushing data, persisting data, and getting data. See with regards to actual, the actual query modeling in Gora, people tend to, to want to use other tools. So um, this is kind of actually reflected in the way that we generate persistent beans, right? So we per, per generate persistent beans with a writer's schema, an Avro schema. Um, one thing that we don't have strong support for in Gora is schema evolution. So things change, and this is because um, the main, probably the main users, the main user base, um, are focused, as I says, on pushing data and getting data. Maybe not querying it um, as much. They'll maybe even, if it's Cassandra, they might be using CQL, or they might be using the native query language. You know. Um, however. I think what we've been mostly focusing on is trying to drive Gora towards 
the standard um, storage abstraction for NoSQL stores, so extending data store support, you know, trying to keep up with revisions of, 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 of you know, newer revisions of, of the underlying uh, databases. Part of that um, for us um, means trying to learn more about different data stores. However, one of the um, benefits of Gora, one of the real strong use cases is that we want to retain um, or we want to interfere as little as possible in um, it, too much uh, control as such within Gora of the underlying data source. We want to utilize the full database support that we can get. So we don't, we don't muck around too much. We don't mess around too much with that kind of stuff. Um, so maybe we, can, maybe we can do something with regards to, to, what, to what you're talking about. And another thing as well, to be, to be honest with you, Tom, is that um, it's focused, Gora's mostly focused on NoSQL stores. Is, is anybody in here uh, used Gora or checked out the code base or anything? No? Aye. I mean, it's... Uh, what Tommy's saying is something that we are actually... We're, we're discussing just to get a better idea. The project. The main project. I mean, one of the things with uh, ODT is that Gora would provide a rich storage abstraction for the file manager component where whatever support that's currently there could be you know a lot uh, a, a much richer um, variety of and that's ba that's based on the query model that's entirely based on the query model so you might have um, um, products in ODT that you might have some um, requirements to query them in some certain way. Um, and Gora would be a, an excellent fit there. Um, and there's a ticket open for that, which once, I've, once we've addressed this um, persistency API in Gora and we've released that code base, then I'll, pr I'll probably start work on that um, and get that in there. So um, that's it, really. Thanks, thanks very much for, for coming to, to see this. Um, and there's another, I mean, if, if any of this kind of sort of abstraction bits and pieces of, is of any interest, I've got a talk tomorrow on building, you know, big data search stack. So using Nutch for crawling, using Gora underneath that, there's not too much in Gora, but we've been through some configuration properties for persisting web page data into um, Apache Cassandra, um, setting up, you know, Cassandra in order to do that. And... Uh, so there's a wee bit more on that. There's, a, there's some more on that. And actually, I'm, go, I'm going to do a lightning talk tonight on the um, Persistency API, the, just a, a kind of whirlwind tour of, of the Persistence API for the next release of Gora. So um, there's going to be a wee bit more on that. So as I said, thanks very much for coming to see this one. And uh, hopefully it's given you at least some t stuff to think about. Um, and it'd be nice to see you on the de dev lists or, or whatever if, if you've got some questions about you know getting set up with Gora and stuff like that, it'd be great. Um, that's us. Thank you.